I'm going to talk mainly about flow, and I've tried to connect several bits of my lab's work together um, under that theme. Uh, it, it, it will be in essentially three, three parts. I, it was going to be four, but I realized it's far too much. So I've, I wanted to start by introducing what we do in my lab so you can get an idea of what our, our objectives are and then move to the, to the main talk. So if you want a, a, a key phrase for our lab, it is systemic signaling. And it used to be just in development, but we've got laterally very interested in the defense functions of the vascular system, particularly spreading immunity um, to some extent to pathogens. But uh, today I'm going to talk a bit about, about aphid immunity uh, right at the end. So we have uh, a, a range of things going on, and, and there's not necessarily connections, obvious connections between them. But I, I'm going to talk a bit about vascular proteomics today, uh, particularly in the cucurbit system. I'm going to talk a little bit about our, our aphid work and on two systems. Um, I'm going to talk about flaring proteins and I was switching of meristems. I'm not going to talk about potatoes today, unfortunately. It's just not time and it's not really a flow in story anyway. And we're very interested in uh, non-cell autonomous signals in general, things that can get out of cells and influence cells in, in other parts of the organism. So without any further ado, um, this is what I want to really capture today is, is the idea that flow in textbooks, of course, is the sugar transport system. Um, but has many other roles, many other faces. And under development, we study small signal molecules, so particularly meristem activation and deactivation through molecules such as cytokine and ABA, stragalactone, and so on. I will leave that out of today's talk completely, but I'm happy to talk to anybody about that later on. What we've been working on for the last 10 years alongside has been larger molecules, and, and the one that has come to mind has been the FT protein, which has emerged as a very exciting story, which now essentially explains how flowering time can be controlled. And I'll, I'll, I'll go through a bit of that later on. And underlying a lot of those studies has been some of the basic toolkit of, of plant physiology, and, and, and especially using, using grafting to do different challenges between genotypes. I'm also going to deal with defense, so the phloem proteome, a, a little look in, at what's in, a, in, in the phloem. Um, I'm going to highlight a project we have at the moment on cucurbits, which have been a classic phloem model, but with a, a, a real twist that I think if you don't know about, you should know about. Uh, I then want to think about aphids and their dietary preferences, and finally coming to a, a bit on the, on the immunity to, to aphids. So let's start with... Um, what I, th I think is an exciting story, and then many labs have been working on it. I, I, I'll give you a short version of my slant on it, but most of you will probably have read a bit about FT and, and this, this Florigen story, which um, in, in my lab started about 10 years ago, where we had this discussions with George Copeland about our Arabidopsis grafting platform, and we, we thought we could probably do something with this concept of having a, a shoot with a, a, a flowering signal being produced and a, a, a second mutant shoot grafted to that that would be complemented across a graft. And uh, the, the end of the story is that, yes, we managed to, to show that. And I just want to give you some of that evidence. So this is some of the work that led us to get very excited about um, the control of flowering. I actually wanted to do a PhD on flowering time um, at Y College way back in the 70s. I was told, no, it was a bad thing to work on. Strangely, I came back to Y and did exactly the same um, in the 2000s. So I'm not sure if that's a, a good career story or not, but it, that, that's, that's the facts. Um, what allowed us to make progress was the, the Arabidopsis model with its genetic resources, uh, its flowering time mutants in particular, and also being able to insert transgenes under um, either overexpression conditions or tissue-specific expression conditions. And simply what we're trying to do is, is cause uh, apologies, a signal from this side to affect flowering on this side. So this is the experiment. We use a wild type donor, so it's native expressed um, flowering signals under, under long day inductive conditions. And this is a Y grafted, so a two shooted graft. CO, mutant CO is one of the key elements of the photoperiod pathway in, in Arabidopsis. Um, and we know it is a, a late flowering mutant under normal conditions. When we added this wild type donor, we had a, a, a very significant rescue of flowering time, and others, the, the CO mutant came back to almost normal flowering time. So that's, that's the visualization. At, at this age, that shoot should not be producing flower buds, but it, it, it is. And this is the, the, the graphics showing that 
by counting leaf numbers. So few leaves means early flowering, many leaves means late flowering. Uh, this is the key one where a control CO plant ungrafted makes 16 leaves before it flowers, whereas the grafts made about, about 10 leaves, so almost, almost as early as the wild type controls. So this is effectively as good as we could do it, a, a full complementation by mystery compound, mystery molecule X moving from left to right. So it took us a bit longer to work out that actually CO was not mobile, but that's logical because there's a <coughs> transcription factor and is largely resident in the nucleus. But CO was already known to regulate FT, um, a, small, a small mobile protein, as we found out. And the way we demonstrated mobility, and this is really a, a very condensed version of quite a long story, was to do another graphing experiment where we used phloem expressed FT with a GFP tag. Now, GFP makes the molecule a bit bigger and a bit um, lumpy and not quite as mobile as it would be, but it is still biologically effective. So this donor caused this FT mutant late flowering plant to flower significantly earlier. Not fully complemented, but that's because of the size of the molecule. What this slide mainly shows is that these green strands of GFP are the FT-GFP fusion protein sitting in the protofloam just below the apical meristem shown with a star because it's not very clearly imaged. Uh, so this is the expressing donor side. This is an FT mutant not carrying the transgene uh, as a graft receiver and it is showing again in the phloem the receipt now is the delivery of FTGFP into the subapical meristem from where we, we, we think, although we haven't ever shown it, it diffuses cell to cell into the target cells up in the, in the top of the meristem. So the molecular detail is, is too much to, to take in, but essentially we have FT being regulated in the leaf, so it's a long distance element exported into the phloem where it arrives um, in, in the apex, so it is then interacting with transcription factors to regulate downstream target genes. So there's a lot of story there. Um, this is essentially enough to say that we think we've shown bioactive <coughs> molecule complementing a mutant to cause flowering and, and actually visualizing it at the same time. What I thought I'd do today was highlight that we're, we're now thinking, and this has not worked from our lab but from many other labs, that FT has a much wider set of roles. So to think of it as, as just a florigen is, is perhaps is, is, is too, too narrow a concept. It is more, the, more like a, a, a switching molecule. It can control changes, transitions in developmental um, phases of, of many, in many different contexts. Um, work by Uwe Nielsen in, in Sweden showed seasonal dormancy was regulated by FT overexpression. So the, the, the switching off of growth at the end of the season seems to be dependent on switching down of, of FT expression. Very exciting work on potato tuberization from, um, from largely from Spain has shown that uh, an FT homologue um, in, in potato is sufficient to cause tuberization and it's a, it's a different homologue from the one that causes flowering in the potato. So there's, there's two, at least two FT-like signals going on in potato. And again, it's a switching uh, mechanism. These lateral stolons under the ground cease apical growth and start radial growth. And um, Lisa Lifshitz from Israel has been working on uh, leaf determinacy in tomatoes. And essentially, the FT quantity and the ratio to another homologue called TFL1 seems to determine how complex the leaves become. So you can actually titrate leaf shape by modifying the ratio of two different proteins. So there's a lot of things going on in addition to the flowering story. And that's all, that's all published work. In terms of intriguing phenomena, I, I thought I'd just show two more, two more slides. Uh, one is from, I think it's from Dan, Danny Zamier. Um, this was published about three years ago, where if you took two lines of tomato, the, the, the classic M82, and crossed it with an FT knockout mutant, so it's, it's lacking the flowering gene, um, the F1s had a, a huge heteros heterosis effect in terms of tomato yield. Now, that, that looks like too good to be true to me, and there's some complex genetics to explain it, which I will not go into today, but read the paper if, if you want to understand where that came from. But it does tell us that there's something going on about ratios of signaling molecules. Probably this is to do with suppressing determinacy of tomato, because not normally tomatoes go determinate, and that is a lot of the high-yielding varieties are, are, are have determinate inflorescences. 
The second one was a bit further afield, so soybeans. So the soybeans have been domesticated over well, a, a long period of human civilization. But the, the, the key, one of the key traits was, again, determinacy. So instead of having long vine-like plants, you have short or semi-short um, determinate uh, inflorescences. And it turns out that that locus uh, DT1 encodes a TFL1 homologue. So TFL1 is a negative, very close homologue of FT, essentially acts antagonistic. And we'll come to that in, in, in just a minute. So by um, probably independent selection, several allelic variants have been found, all of which encode modified TFL1 proteins. So there's a lot of context for crop production where FT and TFL1, aside from its role in flowering, seems, seems to be um, very, very evident. And then we, we might think of biotechnology applications. This is from Steve Strauss. If you overexpress um, FT homologs in populace, and in fact, in many other woody perennials, you can um, induce juvenile plants to flower. And of course, for, for, for breeding, that is enormously important um, because particularly for these long life cycles, the, the number of <laughs> breeding rounds you can get through in, 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 in anyone's lifetime is, is quite limited. So the, the means to get flowers early is, 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 is valuable. However, having to put a transgene in every time is not great if, you have, if you've got many breeding lines from which you're trying to construct new lineages. It's maybe not necessarily the, the simplest way to go, but nonetheless, it tells us that FTs can overcome ju juvenility. So I would see that FT and TFL1 proteins sit, if you like, at the crossroads of, of many aspects of developmental switching. And, and something we're starting to ask is sort of a, a traditional plant growth regulator question, can we bottle it? Now, there are many growth regulators out in the market, gibberellins, ABA analogs, antagonists, auxins, um, auxin, um, analogs, uh, and, and they're commercially valuable. They, they do good, reliable jobs in, in horticulture and agriculture. We're now dealing with a different game. It's a protein. So can we put a protein into the bottle? I'm not, I'm not sure that we can. Nonetheless, if you look around the web, you can find um, several products that claim to be Florigen um, from different parts of the world. I suspect that none of them actually contain an FT protein, but it's giving us the idea that maybe we should be thinking about on-off, on-demand um, technologies for flowering. It's, it's something we're starting to work on. I, I can't really talk about it today <coughs> to, simply because the, the work has not evolved enough to, to give you a, a robust story. But we're, we're thinking about can we use proteins as, as growth regulators as an exogenous treatment in, in a controlled, reliable way. So I'll leave you with, with that thought. What I wanted to do was just take you forward a little bit into the understanding of how FT works. So having, we think, got through the phloem to interact with its protein partners, um, it then acts to, to switch on other genes. I wanted to highlight the fact that we have this FT promotive signal, so the positive acting signal, and in the same gene family, the TFL1 inhibitory signal. Uh, this, this shows the, the, the ribbon structures of the, from, from the, the solved crystal um, structures of the two overlaid. So I can't remember which is gold and which is silver, but essentially the two sit very close to each other. And it's only in this little external loop that there's a bit of divergence and the sequence is highlighted down there. In other respects, they're about 60% identical proteins and yet one switches on flowering and the other switches off, essentially. So we're, we're trying to find out why, why that might be. Um, so we're going through all the things that FT is known to do and try and see how many of them TFL1 also does and look for new roles in, in, in TFL1. Again, for reasons of time, I can't go through all those, but I thought I'd just show you one slide. And this is basically proving that TFL1 interacts with a, a group of proteins called 1433s, which are, if you like, bridging proteins in, in many eukaryotic signaling systems. And this is just a, a, a gel shift assay from David Charles, a recently finished PhD student in the lab basically titrated in increasing amounts of recombinant TFL1 protein into a, a constant amount of, of 1433. So that's the unbound 1433 protein. And as it forms a complex with increasing amounts, you see the, the larger molecular weight fraction that's plotted up to show the, 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 if you like, the titration curve, which gives us a reasonably high affinity binding. And this was already known for FT, simply saying that FT and TFL1 both interact with, with 1433 proteins and his solved complex structure gives us this um, W-shaped molecule, which is basically a tetramer. There's 
two 1433s on the arms here and two FTs in there. That you can't quite see the, the joints, but that's, that's the solved crystal structure. We're now moving forward to look for other partners that might explain how TFO1 is negative acting, whereas FT is positive acting. We haven't got the answer yet. But this 1433 story brings me into the next bit of, this, of, of the, the talk today, which is to think more widely about the flowing proteome. So a number of people in the lab have, have, have done this, particularly Zaida Ravat, who did a PhD, and Amanda Kozlo, who did a master's project, basically collected um, Arabidopsis phloem exudate from, from leaves and did a, a stamp collecting exercise to, to see how many proteins we could find that were um, reliably identified. So our, our data came up with about 500 and around about the same time a group in in France published a, a paper with a similar number. So if we add everything together we think there's about at least 700 proteins in phloem. So that's, that's a lot of proteins to be dealing with. I do not want to talk about that list because it is quite um, it's just too extensive and, and in some ways a bit boring to talk about lists. However, if we filter out for the things we might be interested in, we find very few signaling proteins. In, indeed, probably FT and TSF, a, a, another homologue of FT, um, are the only two really well-confirmed mobile phloem proteins we have, if you like, another 700 with other functions. Interestingly, in, the, in our surveys, we found several 1433 proteins, also known as GRFs. And something that's occurred to us as well, if there's an affinity between those two, it is possible that 1433s interact with FT, and this could be part of the mechanism that either enables or assists the, the, their mobility. And that's, that's something we're working on at the moment. If we take a view from, uh, this is a, a, a gene ontology, geo annotation, um, listing of, of the biological processes that these proteins fall into, and we look at which types of proteins are overrepresented and underrepresented within that subset, within that phloem subset against the whole set of Arabidopsis proteins, we start to see some, um, some things we would expect and some things which confirm what we possibly thought might be going on. Particularly that we, we see in the over, overrepresented classes, that's the red bars here, uh, proteins involved in electron transport, energy pathways, of course, it's for synthesis, so you're going to see some intermediates and some enzymes involved there. But a lot of the other overrepresented classes are all to do with stresses and stimuli, external stimuli. So both biotic and this is the um, general stresses are overrepresented. And that perhaps tells us that phloem, as well as conveying sugars and other metabolites, is really key to a lot of defense within the plant. It, it is a responsive system. And at the other end, the underrepresented ones, are, are, uh, apart from the unknowns, are things we would not expect to find in flow, particularly related to DNA and RNA metabolism, because if you remember from your plant physiology texts, the phloem has no nucleus, it has no essentially no ribosomes and no um, transcriptional machinery, and therefore we would not expect to find those proteins there. There may be many other proteins in here that are very important, but simply just not overrepresented in the overall um, analysis. So that gives us a, a field of proteins to compare Arabidopsis with other species, and that's where I want to talk about now, is to, to think about how representative our Arabidopsis phloem is against some of the other phloem models. And that brings us to the second part of the talk, which is on um, the cucurbit system. Now, we didn't previously work in cucurbits, but we got excited by a bit of work done by a PhD student by Chen Zhang, who worked at the Max Planck in, in Golm in Germany, who came to my lab as a postdoc with a story that nobody believed. And it took us another five years to get it, it published, and, but we, we, we did that. And it's essentially about how there's been a mistake in the literature or a misunderstanding of the literature for the last 70 years. Essentially, cucurbits have been used as a flow model because it's very easy to cut a cucurbit. There's a pumpkins, cu cucumbers, melons, and you get this bleeding sap that has been called phloem for a long time. So what I want to tell you today is that, it, if you don't know already, it is actually not really a normal phloem. And, and to explain how the story got mixed up and how we think we've resolved it to a, a better understanding of the physiology. So there's a number of elements to, to, to get to that point. So if you like, cucurbit phloem, although we can cut and collect, it has this historical paradox. Model plants for phloem biology, we get exudate from stems, petioles, leaves, from fruits as well if, if we need to. Um, so it, it, it was a, an easy way into phloem. 
what we've been wondering about is where, is where are these droplets really coming from and is there something different about cucurbit biology? Because most species, when you cut them, do not bleed. There are only a very small minority of families and species that give you ready, um, collectible amounts of, of bleeding sap. You can get milliliter quantities, not microliters. The problem is here. If you analyze these droplets, we find that they are very anomalous compared with comparisons of any other species, particularly the, the sugars and the protein content. So the sugar is incredibly low, which is about 30 times less than you, you'd find in other species, and indeed much less than it would, be, would be required to satisfy the photoassimilate photo transport needs. So it's, it's really not the right stuff. And there's been lots of explanations about dilution during cutting and so on to, to try and get around that. Um, at, at the other side of the story, the protein levels in this stuff, this exudate, are much higher than normal, so about 30 times higher than normal. So it's high protein, low carbohydrate. And this does not make sense. It, it just does not match any um, other species or, or any um, transport models. So what Bai Chen did was to try and re resolve what was going on. And the first thing to point out is that the anatomy of the cucurbit vascular system is very unusual. Um, it is, in fact, a triple system compared with most species which would have a single type of flow. Um, and this, this has been known in the, in the anatomical literature for, for, for decades, for many decades indeed. Uh, if, if you draw it as a little cartoon, we have a, a, a xylem as a reference point and two bundles of phloem either side of, of that, um, that xylem element. So if you like, that's the vascular bundle. And if you stain with fluorescein, you can see uh, fluorescein coming through one phloem and the other phloem. We call one external, one internal with the xylem in the middle. So that's the pinkish colors. So if you like, that's already got two bundles instead of one. The third thing it has, and this is the intriguing one, are these extra fasciculars. So s around the periphery of the vascular bundle, you can see lots of little green spots there. These EFPs are extra, extra fascicular phloems. And they're also found elsewhere in, in the cortex. And you can sometimes see lateral strands connecting between the two. So anatomically, there's, there's, there's a lot going on. The question was, could we link that to, to, to function? And um, what was done by Bai Chen was to do some time-lapse video recording to see if when you cut and then very quickly looked, where did those droplets actually come from? And I hope this video works, but these things don't always play. But, right, it's, it's, it's not a good movie. Let's see it's going to play. Right, so what you're seeing is a cut stem, and I think you can probably see little droplets emerging. And every time it goes black, it's being washed off to remove those droplets and see what comes next. And you can probably see little drops emerging from various places, some right at the outside. Those are the vascular bundles. This has always got a hollow stem. And it's about 30 seconds showing this, this sort of thing. So taking <coughs> still by still, um, immediately after cutting, we analyzed where those droplets were coming from. And I'll show you that in the next slide. So this is a bit, it's a bit crude, but this is how it was done in the lab, so you might as well see the, the, real, the real McCoy. <coughs> Basically, a cross marks the origin of a droplet, so in the very first frame after cutting, and you can see lots of droplets that are about, well, I should put this up to the total number of um, droplets was about 40. There's 13 vascular bundles. Uh, we've outlined the FP, so this is a vascular <coughs> flow, and we find that um, none of the droplets sat on top of the FP, whereas a lot of them were adjacent to the ex external FP, so sitting outside the bundle or inside the bundle, and some were all over the place elsewhere in, in the outer cortex. So a total of about 40 bundles, and none of which sat on the FP. So that told us that we don't think any or possibly the majority, at least, of the phloem is coming from FP. We think it is coming from EFP because those sites, all those crosses, represent EFP extrafascicular flow and elements. So the next question was to work out, OK, if the exudate that everybody studied has come from the EFP, what's going on in the vascular, the vascular system in the FP, in other words, in, in these bundles here? So what Bai Chen did was to freeze dry and dissect out to do some metabolomics. So by taking samples of, we did xylem as well, but we won't show that. He took the external FP, it shrinks away because it's not woody, this is woody. 
um, the internal there and carved out little slices and did an estimation of the total, total sugar content. And what he found was, compared with EFP, which is, always comes up as about 30 millimolar, RFOs are the raffinose family oligosaccharides that are characteristic of, of cucurbits. In comparison, both the external FP and the internal FP had around about one molar sugars. So he had found the missing sugar that was not in the exudate, but it was in the phloem all the time. It was just it was the wrong kind of phloem that was being looked at. So the normal vascular bundle has a normal amount of sugar. So pr problem solved. It all sounds very simple when you put it like that, but it's a fair amount of work to get to that point. We then moved to the, the protein side because we're quite interested in, in, in proteomics. And essentially, two, two approaches. One is to dissect the tissue down and, and do the same as the sugar analysis. The second was to stain up the proteins with amido black. And you can see little strands here. That's the external FP, internal FP, EFP there, xylem in the middle. You can actually pick with the end of an, a hypodermic needle those little gloopy precipitated proteins which are coming out of individual sieve elements and do a proteomics analysis on those. If we do that and compare the EFP profiles, there's, there's many papers on this showing two dominant proteins called PP1 and PP2, uh, which are, are very well studied. Um, compared with that, the FP microdissected profile is completely different, both on a 1D gel, and these are the representations of 2D gels of FP and EFP. I, I think it's fairly easy to say that these are not the same kind of proteomes. The, the dominant protein out of these was one that we called FPP1 for fascicular phloem protein 1. Not very imaginative, but it seems reasonable. And it is the main band on 1D gels, and it appears in some different isoforms on 2D gels. We wondered what that protein was, or that family of proteins was, and it turns out that FPP1s are quite strongly related to another class of proteins called SEO-like, so sieve element occluding family proteins, which have been best described in legumes, uh, where they have a very rapid blocking function. They make this forosome structure, which is a contractile calcium-dependent protein complex. So doing a bit of a... Uh, simple phylogeny on those, we found that the cucurbit clade, um, FPV1s, was quite closely related to this SEO legume clade, so there's both metacargos and, and soybeans in there. So knowing that leg legume SEO proteins have demonstrated flow and blocking functions, we've hypothesized, and I don't really have time to show you the data today, that probably these FPV1s, which are dominant in cucurbit flow and have since been found in many other species, perhaps have a very strong role also in blocking the flow in, in, in the cucurbit system. So that's something that's a work in progress. We haven't got much further than that. Uh, what we wanted to do, though, and this is now work funded by a, a, a grant that's been running for a couple of years, mainly the work of Rosa Lopez Caballo um, in, in, in the lab, was to try and work out and get a bigger picture of the difference between an FP proteome and an EFP proteome. To do that, she's done a lot of tissue microdissection, so a cartoon of a stem, a uh, slice of a stem with the different tissues mapped up, her pictures of the stained up bits of tissue. So she's essentially carving slices out of FPs. We also did xylem and cortex and collected EFP exudate at the same time. So we had four tissues to analyze, um, and gels look like gels, and you can see that they're not the profiles are not the same. So for both our species of interest, the pumpkin, which is the easier one to work on because it's bigger, and the cucumber because we've got a genome sequence, and, and compared the stories in both of those. So taking gel slices for proteomics, under LCMS, we then end up with a whole raft of proteins, and these sort of pretty colorful Venn diagrams tell us a lot, and I don't want to go through all the detail, but I want you to focus on the FP and EFP for each. So in pumpkin, FP and EFP, that's, if you like, the, the numbers down each side, and then the shared bit. There's really very little sharing between FP and EFP proteome sets um, in pumpkin. A little bit more in cucumber, but we think that's because the microdissection is a little bit harder, and any time you do a dissection, you're not dealing with 100% pure tissue. The other possibility, of course, is that FP and EFP express 
some of the same proteins anyway, in, in naturally. But we, we think we've got convincing evidence that FP and EFP are different compartments within the stem and thus also within the leaf and are distinctive from cortex and, and xylem. So we're starting to get an understanding of the tissue map of proteins within the tissue. Now, these are moderately extensive lists, but not, they're probably not exhausted by any means. We, we've, we've done a proof of concept, if you like, here. So again, this is telling us that there are many unique proteins in each of these prote flow and proteomes, and would suggest that the overall function of each is also divergent. What we wanted to do, though, was really prove the point that, because when you do proteomics, just discovering proteins, there's a chance that low, low abundance uh, members are not readily discovered and they might be there. So to do quantitative um, MRM-based mass spectrometry was, was a better route. So we picked a couple of reliably, uh, reliable dominant proteins, both from uh, that were in our FP list and analyzed whether they're present in the FP sample, and of course they were, and then whether they're present in the EFP samples and found they're absent. Likewise, we took some EFP targets, so uh, a lipoxygenase and a cystatin family member, which we found, of course, were in the EFP because they were designed as targets for that. And we, when we compared with the FP proteome, uh, possibly just about present, but essentially very, very different profiles of those two. Now, there was a bit of literature suggesting that um, pumpkin and cucumber might be different, so it's a bit of a fine point. But we wanted to check whether in the very first moments after you cut the tissue, there'd be some FP bleeding out in amongst the large amount of, of EFP. So to do a time series, cut, wash, cut, wash, cut, wash, and collect various samples, this is again one of Rose's experiments, over a, a short period and collecting those droplets, analyzing them separately, and seeing whether that profile changes over the first few minutes of exudation. And essentially, they don't. So there's um, a very stable profile by gels. You can see that's EFP collection time 0, 1, 2, and cucumber very stable. S a bit of a change in, in pumpkin, but the, point, the main point is that we do not find this dominant marker FPP1 at any stage in these profiles of the exudate. So we think that what's in the uh, FP stays in the FP and does not cross-contaminate the EFP flow. To put a little bit more flesh on that, we took one of the protein markers, again, this is the FPP1, which you'd expect to find in, and an FP sample, and there it is. Did this, look for the same protein in EFP exudates at time zero, none, time one, none, and time two, none. And of course, you need a positive control, so the expected EFP marker, shown in green here, is, is present in, in all times and does not really vary in abundance. So overall, we're seeing very distinctive profiles by wide surveys of numbers of proteins and by quantitative proteomics as well. So we, we think we can confidently say, you can never be absolutely certain, that FP and EFP are not the same thing. Therefore, a re-examination, sort of a backing out and looking back at a lot of the old literature is maybe in, in order. So, how many for time? Yeah. Okay, this is now the last part of the talk. Um, we then wanted to think about, well, we've got this EFP and we've got an interest in defensive functions of flow, um, particularly relating to aphids because they're natural flow and feeders, what might be going on? So if, if FP is atypical, um, what the heck is it doing? And something that I've been wondering about for a little while is whether other species actually do have something like EFP, but we just didn't realize. And I want to introduce this idea of a ring of defense that actually plants have defensive outer layers. We talk about the epidermis often, but maybe some of the internal layers are also important. And if you look at Arabidopsis with its myrosinase cells, they are located outside the phloem. If you take another group, the poppies, with their famous alkaloids and latex cells and expressed in different zones, those cells, making secondary metabolites, are outside the phloem. The cucurbit EFP is outside the phloem. There's a pattern there. It doesn't prove anything. This is just phenomenology. But it's got us thinking a little bit. And indeed, we, we wonder whether cucurbits have overall a different defensive strategy. And one thing we did was a, a, a survey of, from sequence genomes of how many different proteins there are um, in the NBS, LRR, R gene category. Of course, most species have got hundreds. Even Arabidopsis is nearly 200. 
And there's two different clusters here. These are what I call normal species, and these are cucurbits and other species that bleed when you cut. So there's things like um, cassava, manihot, which has got latex canals, there's ricinus, um, castor oil, and these are various cucurbits, and yeah, so it's melon, cucumber, papaya, shown there. These are all little bleeders, if you like, all right? And each one of them has a greatly reduced um, number of R genes relative to its genome size. Don't know what this means, but it's something that was pointed out by San Wen Huang um, uh, in, in the cu cucumber um, nature paper when the genome was first published. So we started to do some experiments on whether aphids might prefer EFP or FP, um, reminding you that FP has got high sugar, it's in the bundles, it's more like a normal phloem, whereas EFP is low sugar, high protein. Potentially a better diet, because normally aphids are nitrogen limited and excrete most of the, the, the sugar, but an atypical composition in anatomy, and we wondered whether there might be some secondary metabolites that would be toxins or deterrents. And to, to actually get a handle on this, we, we took advantage of the, the, the knowledge of the minor vein anatomy. So in the seventh order veins, the, the flow reduces from th three system down to two. So at the bottom side, the, the, the abaxial, we have a normal flow with an intermediary companion cells and the, the, the normal small sieve element, large companion cells. And on the top side, so that's a tracheary element, that's xylem, we have a single EFP type cell, the large sieve element. And we were able to visualize that in Propidium iodide stains cells, it, that's the same structure as you see here. If we look at a no large number of those, we get exactly the same story. So what we then did was think about, okay, let, can we visualize where those aphids are feeding from? And that required the staining of, of stylet tracts, which was done by Jasmine Pham when she was working in the lab. Um, under confocal microscopy, it looks pretty, but it takes too long to do. So she went to slightly cruder variants on light microscopy, and essentially you're able to pick up from aphids feeding from the cage on the top side or the bottom side, where did the style endings end up? So measuring either growth rate, fecundity, or survival. And to cut a long story short, she was able to show that for two species of interest, both Mises and aphids scipii, um, most of the stylet tracts ended up on the abaxial side, which is the normal phloem, uh, even when they're being applied from the, the other side, the aphids are coming in from the other side and inserting the stylets right across the vascular bundle. So you like that's a, a trans arrangement, whereas abaxial to abaxial is, is a cis arrangement. So highly significant percentage of stylets in both species tending to go to the, to the abaxial side of, of the phloem. So it suggests that even though an EFP element might be nearer, they'll tend to go for the one on the other side, which is presumably the sugar-rich one that they, they prefer. We then did some artificial diet work where we extracted EFP and dosed it into um, a standard aphid diet. And essentially what it shows is that when you increase the dose of EFP up to from zero to 40%, you kill aphids. It's quite, quite, quite clear compared with a sucrose diet or, or, or water controls and so on. So this is the progression from 100% survival over five days down to where we are here, 100% death, where you have 40% EFP. So we think that it is not only unattractive, it is actually toxic when you force them to feed on, on that EFP. And that brings us to other questions about defense. So this is the, 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 the second part of the Avis story, which is to think about the, the genetics of um, immunity. So there will be both the genetics of the aphid itself and the R genes within the host. And to bring it back to a phloem context, to think about graft transmissible defenses against aphids. So what we've used is the P. aphid Medicago model because it's the only one where both genomes are available currently. I think that's going to change quite soon. Um, we've shown from Sadia Canville, PhD student's work, that there is a huge diversity when we do a, a essentially a genotype by genotype interactions plot. This is a survival heat map of 25 genotypes of Medicago against eight biotypes of aphids. So there's a lot of diversity going on there. And that would suggest there are multiple R genes and multiple avirulence factors coming from, from, the, from the aphid. So that bit of work, that survey bit of work, enabled some nice aphid genetics where Sadia crossed virulent with avirulent aphids and showed that 
uh, in a RAT1 R gene, is a, a quite well known R gene from Medicago, that d provided that RAT1 gene was present, we could demonstrate a very clear Mendelian segregation of virulence. So when you crossed a virulent by A virulent, you got a nice one to one segregation. If you self the virulent aphids, you got a three to one. And if you took the A virulence, and as you would expect, there was no recovery of virulence. So there's some, a small number of virulence factors um, segregating nicely in aphids, and this is giving us an insight into the diversity within the aphid genome. Uh, we haven't got an understanding of what the coded proteins are, but because we have the sequence, we can start to interrogate at the transcriptome level and at the proteome level of the aphid and narrow down what some of these factors are. And that might help in um, developing more robust aphid resistance strategies for crop breeding. We also want to do, use that system to test whether um, immunity could be primed in plants from a, a, a previous challenge. So if you had a pre-infestation with an aphid, was the plant better protected subsequently or possibly more susceptible, as has been shown for some pathogens? So it's really two things to finish off with. One is to graft resistance susceptible genotypes to see whether you can get a spreading of the resistance into the susceptible component, and then the induction, so using a, a prior challenge. And this is the, the prior challenge bit of work. So it's, it's essentially giving aphids a choice. So it'd either be a resist, resistant and a susceptible, or it'd be a resistant that had been pre-immunized versus one that hadn't. So each time R is resistant plus an avirulent aphid or a virulent aphid, and various combinations. So this is done by Paul Smith, a master's student. So in several cases, we were able to show this one here, where plant B had been previously immunized, it was less preferred by the aphids. So an un, an, a naive, unchallenged plant was a better host than a challenged plant. In other words, there was something making the aphids behave to walk towards plant A versus plant B. And we see the same when we compared resistance and susceptible. There's a small um, non-preference of the resistant plant, but a very much stronger non-preference when we pre immunize in this case, both sides, a very, very strong preference to move to the susceptible plant. However, if we did that experiment with a virulent aphid, so the one not carrying the virulence factor, um, we see that it is totally dependent on the aphid genotype. So there's, there's both host genotype dependent and aphid genotype dependent elements going on there. So the, the take home message is that yes, there is spreading of immunity but it's conditional on the R gene and it's conditional on the aphid biotype. The second experiment was to do something slightly similar but do it spatially separated rather than separated in time where we grafted combinations of susceptible and, re and resistant plants in, in reciprocal combinations. And again, we showed that this was um, dependent on the biotype of the aphid, but particularly on the presence of R genes. So by grafting metacargos in a very simple system, we end up with signs of at least one type on each plant. You can do multiple grafts. And the take home message is this, that this is measuring relative growth rate. So a negative growth rate is a dying non-feeding aphid, which is a resistant reaction. Positive growth rate is um, happy and, and thriving. So on susceptible signs, you'd expect um, success and incompatibility here negative. This is the susceptible sign on a resistant rootstock, and we now see uh, a resistance reaction. So this is genetically uh, susceptible, but something has come from that rootstock to, to enable essentially resistance reaction. We've seen this in a number of experiments. It's, it's sometimes partial. In this case, it's a reasonably strong demonstration. So we think there is an element of R gene dependent immunity that spreads beyond the location of that actual R gene. We do not know what it is, but obviously it's something we're keen to find out about. So I think that's a good point to perhaps draw it to a close. I've sort of bombarded you with quite a lot of diverse information on both development and defense. Just summarize some of the main points and, and some directions perhaps for, the f for, for future research. So we're very excited to be involved in the FT protein story. Uh, now emerging is not just a flowering story, but flowering time manipulation is something we're very interested in either for accelerated breeding, um, things like crop scheduling, where you want to shift flowering times to get a, a crop to a, a niche market, and even things like climate change mitigation, where 
seasonal temperatures might maybe changing uh, flying patterns. So perhaps instead of changing the genotype, we can look at ways of manipulating flying time directly. We think we've resolved this strange paradox of cucurbit phloem that the FP and EFP are divergent but parallel vascular systems with the FP blocking immediately after cutting and EFP looking like it has a number of defensive functions. And that links into the idea of the phloem conducting some aphid immunity, which is both race specific and R gene dependent. That was a, a G by G interaction we're looking at. And we're now thinking about using the genomes of these systems to develop, um, to be long term resistant stacking um, strategies to, to try and get re robust resistance in crop varieties. Obviously, at the moment it's restricted to Medicago, but with more crop sequences and more aphid sequences coming into play, um, dealing with major horticultural and agricultural crops is, is also possible. We also think there's um, the, the insights into aphid genetics give us the ability perhaps to predict how rapidly new biotypes may evolve and that may help models that will help the breeders. You know, if, if we understand the cryptic nature of, of virulence, we can perhaps have a, a more rounded view of how to develop crop breeding strategies. So many people to thank, of course, um, collaborators by Chen, who was in our lab now back in China, Chinese Academy of Science, George in, in Max Planck, and, and a whole raft of people I've tried to mention all the way through. Particularly want to pay tribute to Glenn, who is, was formerly with Imperial, is now uh, a high school teacher. He was instrumental in, in all the aphid work, uh, getting it started. And we, we're still working, working with him and a number of other people that I've mentioned as we went through have all contributed to this project. And of course, I need to thank BBSRC for funding some but not all of this work. So thank you very much for your attention. Thank you.